this thing's for real out here. This is not the one, one man show out here. Boxing not run by one individual, run by many. A young guy like James with his attitude couldn't manage himself. You know, he got fighters to manage themselves. He couldn't manage himself. Too hot headed. For now, James Tony is still managed by Jackie Callum, but her contract expires in July, and James has given her anything but a vote of confidence. I'm still going to do what I've always done for James, and then when July comes, you know, we'll sit down and we'll talk and we'll see where his head is at and his heart, where his career is at. Because I don't really believe anybody else could do a better job for him or care more about him than I have. And I really worry that if he were to end up with the wrong person who wouldn't be understanding of him, they really could, you know, have a, a clash and, and something bad could happen. I don't trust him. Damn, so I don't even trust my damn self no more. So I ain't trusting nobody. I just got to do what I got to do. You know, I got this, I got this, I got this, I don't care attitude. I got this f you attitude. I don't care. And then, you know, I'm going back to my old stuff, how I used to be, when everybody supposedly said I was a gang bang drug dealer. That's, I'm going back to that, my old way. I have to be, because I got to defend myself now. People like her, who claim they would care about us, but then stab you in the back. Big ass sniper and really warm. This week's update, James and Jackie have gone out of their way to present an image of solidarity, walked into a news conference a couple of days holding hands. No word about what happens in July, but for the moment, the picture they present is that everything is back together. You think we've heard the last of this, Larry? I doubt it, Jim. Jackie herself reminded me that it was Ernest Hemingway who said, never fall in love with a fighter. One way or another, it'll break your heart. Tail of the tape for this light heavyweight battle, and you'll see that James Tony enters the ring having made weight at 175 pounds. It wasn't all that easy for him. He has a four-inch height advantage over the unusually short five-foot-seven-inch light heavyweight 1992 Olympian Montel Griffith. Just hours before the weigh-in, Tony was spotted working out in a spa, losing weight. I suspect that if he was a sumo wrestler, the 350 pound limit he still have to work to make weight bunch that numbers larry take a look at the activity of these fighters griffith is not a very active fighter he's a cautious boxer puncher tony generally comes down to fight at what we're up to fight at whatever level his opponent fights at not going to see many jabs from griffin he likes to hook Going to see some good jabs from Tony, who works off it with everything else. Rules of the bout with our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. The James Tony Montel Griffin fight tonight will be 12 rounds. There is no standing eight count, no three knockdown rule. You cannot be saved by the bell in any round, including the last round, and only the referee can stop the fight. Jim. All right, Harold. Montel Griffin's dad ran a gym in Chicago called Windy City Boxing. And Griffin first went to the gym to train and learn the sport at age five. Later gave it up at age 12 after his father's death when his mother, a Jehovah's Witness, forbade him to box until he reached adulthood, went back to the sport, and came out of nowhere in a one-year amateur whirlwind to make the Olympic team in 1992. As a professional, 14 wins, no losses, eight KOs. Much of the time, he must scrape for a decision because he seems to lack finishing power against many good light heavyweight opponents. James Tony has fought once before as a light heavyweight, knocking out Anthony Hembrick at a time when Hembrick was ranked in the top 10. His overall record, 44 wins, the one loss to Roy Jones in his last fight, after which he said, I can never make 168 pounds again. Having made 175 for this fight, he stepped on a scale in his locker room an hour and a half ago at 187 pounds. So again, he's gained 12 pounds between weigh-in and entry into the ring. Right now, let's go up to ring announcer Michael Buffer for the brief fight introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Grand Garden here at the MGM Grand of Las Vegas, Nevada, where tonight, Bob Arum's top rank incorporated along with your undisputed, undefeated king of beers, Bud Weiser. This Bud for you presents an evening of championship boxing. Now, before we continue, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to make a special introduction. Sitting here at ringside tonight, along with his broadcasting partners from HBO Sports, Jim Lampley, Larry Merchant, and Harold Letterman, is a man who in 1968 captured Olympic gold 
1973, he became heavyweight champion. He took a little time off, and then again, just 13 weeks ago, right here at the MGM Grand, once again became the heavyweight champion of the world, Big George Foreman. This bout is sanctioned by the Nevada State Athletic Commission, Chairman Dr. James Nave, Commissioners Nat Carasalli, Dr. Elias Ghanem, Luther Mack, and Crispin Rivera, Executive Director Mark Ratner. Chief Physician, Dr. Flip Homansky. Physicians at ringside, Dr. Al Capanna and Dr. William Berliner. The timekeepers are Jane Broadfoot and James Cavan. This belt is also sanctioned by the International Boxing Federation. Supervisor ringside is Dan Jones. The three judges scoring this belt on a 10-point must system will be Dwayne Ford, Bill Graham, and Art Lurie. And when the bell rings, the man in charge of the action, referee Joe Cortez. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from the MGM Grand of Las Vegas, 12 rounds of boxing for the IBF Intercontinental Light Heavyweight Championship. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing red with black letters, weighing 173 and one half pounds. From the windy city of Chicago, Illinois, he brings a perfect record as a professional into the ring of 14 and 0. Eight knockouts to his credit. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the undefeated Montel Ice Griffin. And his opponent across the ring, fighting out of the red corner, wearing black and weighing 175 pounds from Ann Arbor, Michigan. He brings a professional record of 44 victories. Only one defeat with two draws. 29 of those 44 victories by KO, and he's captured two world titles. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the former middleweight, the former super middleweight champion of the world, James Lights Out Tony. Montel, Tony, went over the rules in the dressing room. I won a good, clean fight. I made my commands at all times. Shake hands. Good luck, both of you. Tony has been suggesting that he would become more of a brawler and less of a boxer, but he's always been a very disciplined boxer puncher in the ring. Let's see how he deals with a fighter who is sometimes very unorthodox and difficult to get to. And the final footnote on Tony and his woman manager, Jackie Callum, he had threatened not to wear the Star of David emblem on his trunks he has always worn in the past to honor her. But as he enters the ring tonight, he does once again have the Star of David there. Along with the skull and crossbones on the other leg and two crowns, emblematic of the two divisions in which he's won title. I wonder if an archaeologist found that a thousand years from now, if he could decipher it, Jim. <laughs> Star of David, skull and bones, two crowns. Montel Griffin landing a jab, taking a page from Roy Jones's book. Griffin says he plans to try to de-emphasize the jab tonight and lead frequently with the left hook. It really worked for Jones on November 18 against Tony. Well, Tony went out instantly going to the body, which is awful hard when you're shorter than a man and he's going to your body. Man, Griffin is not accustomed to people going to his body, and Tony is going right to the chest. This guy is an expert boxer puncher Tony is. Hard punches early from Tony. He looks much better physically in the ring tonight than was the case after he made 168 on November 18. George, you don't see a lot of five foot seven inch light heavyweight. What are the implications of Griffin's height or lack of it in this match? Uh, I think boxing has always been for the smaller man. It's the art of self-defense, so you're not to look down on him because of his size. As a matter of fact, bends down and comes back up and laying good shots. 
He's going to have to land a lot of hooks. Forget about straight punching because he won't have that advantage. Everything should be in a hook fashion. Landed a looping left to the neck and shoulder of Tony that got a rise out of the crowd. And a short right hand inside. Now Tony let misses let with a sweeping clean. left. But Tony has done something real fine. He's, you watch it. Throws that left right uppercut right to the chest. Come on, work out of that. Come on, don't be holding inside. Don't be holding inside. Big moment for Griffin, but he looks very relaxed in there, George. His trainer, Eddie Futch, says he is a uniquely relaxed fighter. Very at home in the ring. That's true, and he, he acts as well. Griffin well, is deceptive because his long arms are a lot longer than his body. It almost don't go along with his body. They're almost down to his knees. He looks like a fire hydrant and fights like a lamppost. <laughs> now, Tony's got to get in that ring and realize he's James Tony and forget about his past. He's always been a good fighter. Nothing different about him now. Griffith has got to go out there, stay low, take advantage of his lack of height. Griffin aggressive and relaxed in round one. It's been a good opening period for the unbeaten young prospect from Chicago. Get off a little flash. Stretch his mouth. Give him a little water. More, more jabs. When you come with that right hand, even if you miss it, come back with that left hook. I don't need it. Thank you. Keep giving it. Keep giving those things. Just keep walking on. Look this guy over there. Okay? I don't know if Tony was a little puzzled by Griffin or if he was just measuring him to see what he has in the first round. We'll find out in this round. Interesting that though the near legendary Eddie Futch works in Griffin's corner, it is Thel Torrance who talks to Griffin between rounds. There's that good right uppercut right underneath that arm. Just under the breast. That hurts, especially when you've got 10, 12 rounds to go. Griffin early in round two, oh, taking as good, good as he's giving to the body. Exchanges of body punches, dominating the fight so far. I've never seen a guy with a height advantage go down to the body like Tony is doing to Griffin. I've never seen it. Generally, you take advantage of your jab, and you go for the, the head shots and some body punches, but not totally like that. And let me tell you, those body punches are already starting to take their effect. Griffith is starting to do what he said he would not do, said he would box. Well, James Tony said, I'm tired of boxing. I want a brawl. So perhaps by going to the body early, rather than using the jab and his height against Griffin, Tony's trying to elicit a brawl from the smaller fighter. He's initiated it, and the brawl is on. Griffin is even going forward. One thing you don't want to do with James Tony, you don't want to move forward. Don't back him up. Why is that? You're going to run into some good right hands and powerful left hooks. You want to make Tony go come after you. Come on, come on. Break out to me, break out to me. Step back. As long as Tony is the aggressor, you're going to get hit with one or two shots. If you back him up, you're going to get hit with three and four and sometimes five punches. Well, Roy Jones had the ideal formula. Tony came forward, became a target in doing so, but couldn't find Jones enough to punish him when he came oh, forward with aggression. Yeah, yeah, there's no on. doubt about it. Tony is a good puncher. When he has you hurt, he moves forward effectively, but he's not going to do a whole lot of harm following you around because he does it with one shot. James Tony still concentrating on Montel Griffin's body early. Griffin going upstairs and throwing that left jab that he said he would de-emphasize, but which has become a primary weapon early in the fight. 
Two more Griffin jabs. Tony with a short right hand inside. And Griffith puts his left hand all the way down below his weight. Tony just keeps his eyes right on that left jab. He should, Griffith should bring that left jab up a little higher if he wants to land it more often. As long as he keep it low, Tony's going to jab him even right in the chest. He's Good job by Muhammad Griffith. Ali, George. He's always going to hold that left low. One thing that's quickly established is that Griffin is not concerned with Tony's strength he thinks he's a natural light heavyweight and he's fighting an overstuffed middleweight and look remember you can use that jab a little more often so you can keep that suspecting that jab be that face faint and stick that that left hand okay and remember that remember that hook okay double hook once in a while and when you're pulling out don't pull out standing up straight okay pull out yeah 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 okay all right that's good Too much high. Take your time. You catch him now. All right. Take your time. When you, when, you, when you catch him, back with the hook. Not one punch. Eddie Futch, whose voice you heard a few moments ago in Griffin's corner, knew Griffin's dad, who had a gym, as Jim pointed out before. And he also trained Tony's father. So if you're around as long as Eddie Futch is, you've touched about just every corner there is in boxing. That's right. Just about everyone in the sport. You heard Tony say to Bill Miller between rounds, I'm catching him now. And Miller said, don't forget to use the left hook. So both trainers asking their fighters for left hooks. And it's Griffin who gets the better of that exchange. Tony is only looking to get underneath that left jab of Griffin. If he can get under Griffin's left jab, he doesn't care if he lands a punch occasionally. He's tasted his power already. He's not intimidated at all by this light heavyweight's power. And Tony peekabooing there a bit against the ropes, George, maybe thinking that Griffin, at some point along the way, will get arm weary and lose his team. And uh, not only is he arm weary already, he's almost frightened to kind of lead with that jab out there because Tony is going underneath. Doesn't look frightened to me, George. He looks, he looks what his uh, nickname is, Ice. He looks very cool in there. Seems comfortable in there, like a kid who did start in there when he was five years old. Good left, Good left hook. hook by Griffin. Outstanding. Come on, work out, work out, work out. Come on, work out, come on, work out. Punch out, punch out. Watch your head inside. Tell Griffin proving an elusive target here in round three and so far executing his fight plan. Well, let me tell you, that left jab could have been a lot better, but Tony has got him throwing his left jab on the run now. Griffin is a little timid. He doesn't want to lead. He's turning south power. He's doing a lot of desperate things. He's going to make Tony mad with that stuff. No, but Griffin is doing it because he's been hurt real casually like to the body and it hurts so you like the way things are going for James and you think punching power is showing up for him here as a light heavy he has his opponent now he's throwing punches he lands occasionally but they are doing he's doing it so reluctantly as though I'm gonna hit back Griffin manages to stay up Tony goes down that'll be ruled a slip no knockdown Griffin still wobbly about Tony finding his power at this weight, George. It was one punch that wobbled Griffin. Now Tony has to jab if he's going to do it again. And the bell stops Tony's assault.
Here is a, here's a look at that punch that wobbled Griffin. A straight right hand. He, he has almost been lured into this kind of exchange when which is uncharacteristic of the way he's fought in the past. And Tony finally found the range, but got a little excited and let him off the hook there, although it was the end of the round. Let's see if what Griffin has left here at the start of the fourth round. So the big right hand punctuates round three for Tony. Now the fourth begins. He saw Nevada State Athletic Commission Dr. Flip Homansky checking on Griffin between rounds. Tony landed his favorite shot, a counter right hand. There's a hard left hook by Griffin. But at this moment, Tony definitely appears to be the heavier puncher. Now, Griffin is right now afraid to throw his right hand and that's is going to be his most effective punch Tony is even going side to side not only is he in the pocket stepping inside of the left hook and the right hand jab into the body it oh, lands it. another left hand as Tony takes a momentary breather. Typical of his behavior in the ring. The constantly voiced criticism from other fighters. Well, James never fights a full round. It never hurt him much until the Roy Jones fight. Barely missed that counter right hand. Griffin relying increasingly on that leaping left hook. Maybe opening himself up to the right hand more frequently than he'd like. Crowd just settling back in after that near knockdown that ended the third round. It's interesting that Tony not only is able to weave under that left hook of Griffin and the right hand. He's countered with the right hand and he weaves under the left hook. They trade hard punches inside and Tony is getting the better of the exchanges as his power shots seem to do more damage. And Griffin is cut. Griffin showed some moxie, some stomach, some guile in that round to get through it. How much does he have left? Jackie Callan, manager of James Tony and a fixture in his corner in the past, now is distanced from Tony's corner. Bill Miller free to do his work without the manager leaning in over the ropes. Right. Keep setting him up, baby. Keep setting him up the pace a little bit. Your night, James. This is your thing. Pick up the pace. Your night, James. Take it, take, take him to another level now. I want to see something. It's your world, man. Deep work. It's your work. All right. All right. Take this boy to school. Take this boy to school. Put a little more pressure on him now. Take him to school, dog. All right, second talk. Give him another round. Just like that, okay? Okay. Oh, hey, cool, You're the center of the ring, okay? This is a good showing for a prize fighter with just 14 professional fights, George. Yeah, but he's deceptive because he's got so much experience. He started boxing five years old. Exactly. Harold Letterman, your score. 
Larry, I'm impressed with Montel Griffin's punching. I tell you, it's a fight that's being fought under the microphone in the middle of the ring the entire four rounds. And uh, I, I got it uh, three to one, 38, 37, Montel Griffin by one point, because I think he's landing the cleanest shots. But certainly round three, 10 to eight for James oh, Tony when Griffin out, virtually out. went out. I have it two rounds apiece at this time. If Griffin's won around here. Keep on, keep on, guys. Keep on, both of you guys. Harold says that Griffin's won three of them, George. Oh, my goodness. You haven't seen it, right? I have not seen it. Okay. So we have the requisite disagreement along the HBO ringside front. All Griffin is doing is being set up, hurt to the body, and if he's not careful, staying close to Tony like that, but he landed a hard left-hand shot, George. Tony is a coaster, and you notice when Tony is landing a left hook now, Griffith is flinching. Come on, come on, come on, work out of there, guys. Come on. So the essence of what you're seeing is that Tony's punches do on, considerably guys, more there, damage. Is that Not it? only that, he's fighting the kind of fight that Tony wants him to fight. Tony loves those ropes. Griffith said he would not do that. Oh, and those body punches, the left hooks to the side by Tony. Not only does these punches hurt, oh but they destroy a young fighter's career. Another hard left-hand shot for Griffin. Tony with a couple in return. Remember that Tony spent the entire night against the ropes fighting Prince Charles Williams and managed eventually to chop Williams down with a knockout with 15 seconds remaining in the 12th round. Remember, Griffin is putting his, oh, trying to butt heads with a guy who's almost 190 pounds. But then he's fought light heavyweight before, too. Hard right hand inside oh, by gonna, Tony. Gonna, watch your heads inside. Rocked Griffin's head back. Montel content to stand right here and leave Tony in the corner as they trade inside shots. Tony always seems to finish with a left hook to the side. Right hand by Tony, left hand by Griffin. Both fighters landing hard shots in the last five seconds of the round. This is the first of our two main events coming up immediately following Oscar De La Hoya, 1992 Olympic gold medalist, rising sensation of the lightweight division, 15 knockouts and 16 fights. Again, we say it, and this is the third or fourth time we've covered this point, toughest fight of De La Hoya's career on paper against former junior lightweight champion John John Molina of Puerto Rico. Watch pulling oh, back. Oh, when, when you pull back after that, that's when he, he tries to pull that long right hand. Okay. Oh, Try to get oh, underneath. All right. Okay. Give me another round. Light him up and turn him around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They could have fought the fifth round in a phone booth. Only nine jabs thrown in round five between the two fighters. 165 power shots. Someone should tell Tony to adjust his right hand after he throws his left hook to bring it up just a little higher for protection. The only reason he's been hit by a counter left hook is because his hands are just a little lower. But that's the scouting report on him, George, that he can be hit with the left hook as he just was there. Little things like that, you bring in extra trainers to try to help you correct. Another hard right hand by Tony, and you saw the scrape on the left eyelid of Griffin between oh, get rounds. Get him out of there, come on, get him out. Good left hand shot to the body by James Tony. And it was a jab, so you note, taking note. Griffith moves around and, and walks around this very professional for a guy with so so few fights. Professional indeed, but 
prior to the Jones fight, few, if any, fighters in the sport were better at adjusting to the flow of the fight in the ring than James Tony. He didn't pick any walkover coming off that emotional fight with Jones. This is a real fight now here, folks. James Tony says he'd like to fight nine times in 1995. Ideally, he wants to fight in March, he wants to fight in April, he wants to fight in May, and just keep on going. He has two more fights at the light heavyweight. He'll be down to a middleweight again, and he'll be happy to fight as a middleweight. <laughs> no, no, George. He's looking to become a cruiserweight and then a heavyweight, and like virtually everybody in the sport, he wants a date with you. <laughs> Don't they all? Don't they all? Tony has been accustomed to fighting his way down and weight. This time, he's always had to go to the gym to do it. He's had so much trouble making weight in the past that manager Jackie Callen literally suggested to him after the loss to Jones that he could go on national talk shows, complain that he had an eating disorder, and that that would boost the gate for a pay-per-view rematch. <laughs> but Tony is playing playing a game of trying to make him throw that left hook so he can counter over with that right hand again. After the bell, hard left hand by Griffin. Tony wants a payback. And referee Joe Cortez keeps him apart. Hell yeah. They're not jabbing enough. Look here. Sitting right there. Montel Griffin has had 14 professional fights, and only two of them have gone past the sixth round. Keep that chin down. Use that jab. And use that face that you've been, you were using earlier in the fight. And on, on the inside, you use that double hook. Double and triple hook. Stay on the outside. That's the thing. No, you, I want you to stay on the outside. I want you to go in and out. Oh, okay. In and out. When you get inside, I want you to watch inside. There's the exchange. You'll hear the bell. Then you'll see the punch after the bell. Trust me, there was a bell. Did you hear it? <laughs> All right, second go. Bell signals the beginning of round seven. Only the third time in Montel Griffin's 15 fight career that he has been to a seventh round. prospect hard puncher named Jeremy Williams Jeremy Williams and Montel Griffin fought four times as amateurs Williams winning the first two Griffin winning the last two to eliminate a tier for Williams and make the 92 Olympic team hard right hand to the body by Montel Griffin Tony appears unhurt by Griffin's hard shots George. and you know he should never have allowed Tony to know that uh, you hurt me, I went up against the ropes, and you're not coming to get me. That means you got no confidence, even when you hurt me a shot. Tony's just sitting right now trying to find out how in the world is this guy standing up to the punching power he's put on him already. Griffin's corner told him to jab a little bit, work on the outside, and he's not doing it. punches. Tony, though, leaning against the ropes, just as busy as Griffin there. Hard right hand over the top by Tony. Oh, work out, work out, work out. That left 
took right on Tony's chops has been the best weapon so far for Montel Griffin. Tonis constantly keeping up the pressure, throwing that right hand underneath the heart, they call it. And as the, the left jab is making Griffin's head snap back now, that means there's no power in his legs now. Hard left hand by Griffin, and Tony wobbles into the ropes. It was a slip. George, that slip was aided by a heck of a punch. Yeah, he's hurt, George. May regain his senses before the end of the round, but James Tony fighting back with a fury here is trying to erase some of the damaging effects of an outstanding Montel Griffin wallop. Letterman, did the ropes stop Tony from going down? In my estimation, Jim, they definitely stopped him from going down. I called it 10 to 8 because Joe Cortez could have called it a knockdown. Officially, it wasn't a knockdown because Cortez didn't call it a knockdown, but he certainly could have. Let's take a look and see what that what happened there. That's it. It was not even a punch. It was a slip. He hit him on the shoulder and followed up with a shot to the head. So it was. Let's see it. That is a different way. Now, where's the head? Tony has a tendency to throw shots and, and look for the ropes, and the ropes are not there, and he goes stumbling back. I think you're He's right. He's one George. guy who looks to foul on the ropes and, and uh, gets in trouble because of it. Stop call, guys. He loves his back oh, touching the right. ropes like uh, the great basketball player, Moses Malone. He likes for you to bump him first so he can throw his hook. Of course, that was very reminiscent of the backward stagger that was ruled a knockdown in the third round of his fight with Roy Jones. Jim, if you get hit on the end of a punch and you go down, that's a knockdown. And this guy gets hit with a shot, he goes into the ropes. If the ropes weren't there, he would have went down. It certainly could have been a knockdown. I, I've got the fight at this point, four rounds to three, Montel Griffin, 66-65, Montel Griffin by one point. I called round seven, 10 to eight Griffin because of what I thought could have been a knockdown. And certainly 10 to eight Tony. Third. And Griffin's confidence again increases as he trades shots with Tony in the middle of the ring. I have the, the, the fight even with one even round, but I do know this. Tony is a four to one favorite, but Griffin is not fighting like a four to one underdog. That's for certain. I think Griffin is going to make a lot of friends. Yeah, but you said earlier, George, that you didn't think he'd won a round. Do you still believe Griffin has Not a round? round, not a round. Didn't win the seventh. No, if he's got a round, it's because someone gave it to him. So on the one hand, he's impressing you, but on the other hand, you don't think he's won a round. He recovers quick. Tony is throwing some body punches like I've never seen anyone throw to a short opponent. Boy, that was a hard left-hand shot there by Tony, but it was a little bit extended. Griffin is trying to get his head right on Tony's shoulder, right on his chest, which is a difficult thing to do. You see now, Tony reaches for the ropes. He likes leaning on the rope. Good, hard right-hand body shot by James Tony. Griffin lands the left as he steps away. Hard right hand again by Tony, and again, Griffin's feet leave the canvas. You would never guess that Tony ever was a middleweight with that much power in the light heavyweight. Of course, he thinks for three years he wasn't a middleweight. For three years he was a light heavyweight, starving himself to fight as a middleweight. That's the way he sees it. Griffin's face beginning to show the evidence of Tony's hard punches in late rounds of this fight. Tony had no idea that Griffin would be that tough. Break out clean, break out clean. Break out. Now, I'm not sure Montel thought that James would be this stiff a puncher coming up in weight class.
Griffin hasn't gone down, but he sure has done some funny things standing up, George. <laughs> He's shown us some steps. Let's take over the fight, son. Huh? Take over, baby. You can hurt it when you want. Look here. When, when you just step to the left and shoot the left hook. Put the left hook. I want to see it. Well, tell me, okay, Pop. Jab, jab, step to the left, pop that hook. All right. What's your pressure on this man? I ain't seen a, a, a right hand down the pike since that one you hit him and hurt him with. <laughs> Let me see something. Let, meet that jab. <laughs> on the inside, you've got to work. Right. And you can't come out standing up straight. You've got to come down low. Get the thigh well. Get the thigh well. And to the right. All right. Go up to your right. Out, out. All right. Well, let's see if Tony can give Bill Miller that right hand down the pipe he's looking for. They told Tony to give a left hook, and he went out there and missed with it. Good short left inside by Tony. Good right hand by Griffin that time. Get him out of there. Get those out there. You can work out of there. Come on. Griffin cannot throw his left jab at the same time as Tony's. He's got to find a rhythm that he beats him to the jab and not jab along with him. Get him out, get him out. Tony's punch is hurt, but Griffin's trunks are beginning to unravel, sequin by thread by sequin. <laughs> so you're saying that James is knocking the sequins off of him? He sure is at the moment. Well, that helps to set up the narrative for the second fight in which Oscar De La Hoya wants to knock the hairpiece off of John John Molina's head. But we'll get to that later. George should be worried about getting into a, a situation where this fight could go to a decision? I think so. Whenever you are punching, you've been landing the best punches, you should always concern yourself that the rough, the judges sometimes are counting all those little punches that don't hurt you. you got to be concerned. You may have noticed between rounds, our punch stat numbers showed a much higher punch output for James Tony but showed Griffin landing at a higher rate. And sometimes you find yourself saying, this hurt this guy. I've hurt him again. And not understanding that the little punches count too. Tony could find himself in big trouble waiting around for a decision. The crowd comes alive again. Griffin's blood on Tony's shoulder. James landing the hard overhand right. Trying to step up the damage. In the latter stages of round nine. Tony's right hand is going to the side of Griffith's head. And he's, if you just take it a little straighter, just a little straighter. Griffin still fires at will. Keeps his right hand down. better but you can even give me more than that huh? you, can, you can give me better than that can't you well give it to me no you're in great shape this mother can't do nothing with you i got the handle shoot yourself baby shoot yourself you we're coming down the wire this, boy this, this is our rounds come on we need all of these we need every round to come here you at home now you need them again Right? Mm -hmm. All right. So go on and take him on Father's Day. Hey, let's keep that pressure off. Hey, you got a chance. Step left and come back with a power left hook. Okay. All right, let's go now. Keep that pressure on. Keep the pressure. Keep the pressure. Oh, the pressure. Keep oh, the pressure. All right, seconds out. Right. James Tony's punch is landing like at a lower rate 
tonight than was the case through his last three fights as a super middleweight. Maybe because he's concentrating more on power shots here. He came out with a flicking right hand, which is what he should be doing a little bit more. So you got to give the judges something. Tony largely dispensing with the jab. Montel Griffin using it more and more to try to keep James off of it. Tony's got a small cut underneath his eye also. Got to be a little concerned about to keep bumping heads like that. Hard for me to tell the way they treated it in his quarter between rounds, whether that was his blood or Griffin's. Now Griffin assumes command again for a moment, or at least thinks he does. He's got to understand that Griffin is not looking for any telltale signs that I hurt you. Everything he's doing is because, hey, I'm landing points. I think Griffin's probably hoping to get through three more rounds and then waiting to hear what the judges have to say. There's that left hook by Griffin. Get him out, get him out of there. Come on, get him out. Tony should keep his right hand up just a little more. An aggressive Montel Griffin stepping forward in the middle of round 10. Tony seemingly a little unsure in this round, George, as to exactly what it is he wants to do. That's right. He's done everything he's wanted to do previously. Now it's a matter of what am I going to do different? Whoa, did that hurt? That left hook by Tony. But Griffith recovers quickly. Hey, he's a well-conditioned fighter. Those shots hurt. These two fighters sparred with each other in Jackie Callum's gym after the Olympics in 92 when Jackie was interested in signing Montel Griffin to a contract. Spent a couple days there, sparred with Tony and said, I didn't like the way Tony's personality dominated that gym. I felt I should go elsewhere. Good right hand by Tony. And a hard left in return by Griffin. But it's like those bullfighters, once they stick right, you there, with that thing on the back of your neck, they want you to keep fighting back. It makes the punches more effective. Tough fight to score. It will be fascinating to see what three Nevada judges have to say about this one. Remember that when last we looked, our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman, had Griffin leading in the bout. You can believe that the, the doctors are going to step in and look at Griffin this round. Because of the blood? He's been hit with some tough shots. He's tired. you got to listen, okay? Listen, okay? When you throw your punches, you walk around to your right. Don't stand right in front of him, okay? He's tired. Give me the top. He's very tired. Keep that, keep that jab pumping, moving around, and looking for your shot all okay, the time. Okay. Yeah. Two more, two more. Okay, two more. All this guy, I'm gonna get my second win. Now. Okay, all right. He's trying to, guy's okay, trying to get some. Yeah. He's trying to get some air and fight his spurts. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but you don't know, 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 jab. Yeah, yeah jab. Keep that jab. And no, my jab. Darrell Letterman, no, listen, 10 rounds, your okay. score. Larry, a very close 6 to 4, 95, 93, James Tony. I thought he did enough with hand speed right, seconds, to win rounds 8, 9, seconds, and 10. Up. To take the lead in the championship rounds, I think he's turning it on a little. And I think the heavy arms of Montel Griffith is on the show. The, water, the guy's just tired. I have Tony ahead by a point now. I got that water quick. They go into round 11. Second time past the 10th round for Montel Griffin. For James Tony, it's the 11th time in his career that he has fought more than 10 rounds. And he's constantly throwing that right uppercut to the body. Griffin said in the corner that he's getting his second win together. That could be trouble for Tony. Once that numbers through 10 rounds, Tony throwing 131 more punches than Griffin, but Griffin landing just as many as James. So he has the higher connect percentage, according to our punch stat computer operators. Good right uppercut by Tony. Your hands are free, guys. Your hands are free. First time all night that he's countered a left jab with a right uppercut onto the head. 
Tony with hard right hands to the body. Five minutes of fighting time left. Good right hand by Griffin. Activity level picking up just a little bit now. Let's see how hard Tony tries to take this out of the hands of the judges in the last four and a half minutes of the fight. George has a former two-time world champion. Will James Tony get the likely benefit of the doubt from the judges? No doubt about it. The judges got to understand that Tony has a rhythm, he has a style, and then when he's going forward, jabbing it, hey, he's doing what he want to do. The judges are going to respect this. He's been around long enough to know it, and they know exactly what he's doing. Tony's left eye closing just a little bit. We've charted the damage on Montel Griffin's face from the beginning. All right, bring out, bring out, bring out. And now after a pretty active first two minutes in round 11, they both look a little tired as they come down the stretch of the 11th. Tony's looking for a knockout now. He no longer wants to body punch and trade. He wants a knockout. What would be the best way to get it, George? He's going to have to now kind of bring his left hook underneath and finish it with a right hand. Bring the man's head up to your right hand. Now he's throwing a jab, and he goes down, and he misses with the left jab. Left uppercut, right hand is what, what it's going to take. Okay, bring up, bring Not a bring left up, bring jab up. and right hand. Montel Griffin, clearly tired. Not able to throw many punches in the last minute of this round. I've got to have three minutes. Give me three minutes. Lean up, lean up, James. Lean up. Three minutes to win this fight. We, 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 we need it. Don't blow your nose. We got to have this last round. <laughs> I need this last round. You hear me? You want this fight, man? Listen, you want this fight, you take it, okay? Yeah. You, but you got to be smart. Yeah. Don't give him that. Box the back, guy, back. keep the left hand, keep going down to his right. Touch okay? him up, touch him up. You know what I'm saying? Right. Don't let him get nothing. He'll, he'll, he'll come out with a spurt, but I want you to be smart. Yeah. In the night. Get him home. All right. Get home. You let him happen, baby. Fight. Get home. Let him happen. All right. Here, here. Give no prisoners, James. Let's give this motherfucker. All right. Counter punch. Get out of here. At the top. Montel Griffin might still be able to pull this fight out. James Tony is going to have to work in this 12th round. A vast difference in experience may be evident here. It's the 48th professional fight of James Tony's career, the 15th for Montel Griffin. If, I, if I'm Griffin, I'll hit and hold. He'll be renowned if he can go 12 rounds with James Tony. And if you're Tony? Hey, keep your left jab going. Now you'll go with a right hand every now and then, but don't go trying to finish him and give him a chance to get a flash knock, knock down on you. And that one just missed, and it gives Griffin a clear picture of what Tony will be trying to do in the round. Good left hook inside by Tony. Come on, give me a clean round, guys. Give me a clean round. Griffin pushes James away, and now will fire the jab from time to time to try to keep Tony off of it. Tony comes forward with the right hand and lands it. And did it hurt? It was, on, it was high on top of the head. The only thing that kept Griffin up, the, the right hand was too high. It's got to be a on, left uppercut in the right hand if Tony on, wants to catch him. He can't just throw his left jab out there. Come on, work out of there. Come on, work out of there. Yeah, it's a free. Come on. Somewhere in Chicago, Montel Griffin's Jehovah's Witness mother hates the fact that he's fighting. But he had to do what he wanted to do. It took him to the Olympics in 92. Can it bring him to an upset victory over James Tony tonight? For Tony, what's at stake is nothing short of the rebirth of his career in the wake of a devastating loss to Roy Jones. Can he once again be one of the best?
in the world. Tony is true to the profession. He's seeking a knockout every minute. Punch the guy out. Punch the guy out of there. And you never count out James' chance to score the knockout. Remember, he knocked out Prince Charles Williams in this ring last summer with 15 seconds to go. Griffin is doing what I would have told him to do. You make it 12 rounds, be famous. Don't go in there trying to mix it up with one of the best punchers in the uh, in this weight division. Tony is coming down the stretch like a thoroughbred here. If he needs this round to win the fight, he appears to be winning it. Yeah, I think Griffin just sort of ran out of gas. Physically, and he's looking maybe up. mentally as well in the last two rounds. Griffin looked up to the clock. He wanted to know how much time he's got. And now he gives it all he's got and finishes with a savage flurry. And both fighters dance around the ring in a victory the distance what do you have Harold Letterman Jim, uh, Jim I got it seven rounds to five 114 112 James Tony I thought James actually did pull out the last round I thought he pulled out four out of the last five to tell you the honest to God's truth uh Montel Griffin certainly had a good round around 11 made it very very close I had two 10 8 rounds without a knockdown because there were two really you know two really staggers that almost were knockdowns I mean certainly James Tony deserved the 10 8 in the third Montel Griffin definitely deserved the 10-8 in the seventh, in the eighth, the seventh, pardon me. Uh, but I thought James Tony did enough punching to pull the fight out. I honestly think that this fight may be a split decision. So your instinct is to look for a split decision. And uh, I can see promoter Bob Arum in the ring looking over Michael Buffer's shoulder to try to get a look at the cards. Now let's go to Michael Buffer to find out who won the fight. Ladies and gentlemen, here at the MGM Grand, we go to the scorecards. Dwayne Ford scores the bout. 114 to 114, he has it even. Bill Graham scores the bout. 115 to 113, and Art Lurie scores it 116 to 112 for the winner by majority decision. Montel Ice for James Tony, and yet another lesson in how difficult it is to handle the subjective task of judging a boxing match. Larry Merchant stands by in the ring. Larry. James, your feelings about the scoring? I thought I won the fight. I did have to win the fight, but um, judging to see my way, so he got the decision. Was he a tougher fight coming off such an emotional fight as your last one than you thought it would be? No, not at all. It was just, you know, just the judges. I got a bad decision. Was he a hard guy to fight because no, of his no. size? No, not really. I did what I had to do to win. But, hey, I didn't get the decision late. Oh, I'll be back. No problem. Are you in shock? No, nah, yeah, I'm in shock. Yeah, yeah, I'm in shock. I lost the fight, you know. I, I had to get beat. I'm in shock. I'm amazed. Thank you, James. No Jim? James Tony and Jackie Callen, are you in shock, George? More than anything, than words could ever mention. Shocked. So you think this is a uh, a highly questionable decision? It's really a blow to a wonderful sport. It's a blow to a wonderful gladiator. 
And really, it's an insult to a great knight. I don't know how it happened. But, George, it, it's a relatively close fight. I mean, the, the guy is in the fight all the way in the eyes of most. You heard how Harold scored it. I think that you'd be in a small minority in saying that James won all the early rounds. I might be a minority. Be a large. <laughs> I take that bet. You do. Larry Merchant stands by.